devoted to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hi there viewers and welcome once again to This Is Your Bible. My name is Peter Pickering and on behalf of the Christadelphians in this area we give you a warm welcome to another program discussing your Bible in your home. One thing we can all be sure of, that we are all going to die. Of course religion really addresses the problem of man's death and how this problem might be solved. But why is it that we die? And what is the real nature of mortality? Whilst all of us can have very close experience of what mortality is, that is, we are dying creatures, but we can all imagine the possibility of a life that never dies. It's often seen in such folklore uh, poetry or folklore images like Peter Pan and Tinkerbell and uh, things like that, which show us that there's a concept that something never dies. The fact that we can think about something never dying immediately proposes the possibility that there could be a state of life in which there is no cessation never-ending, just going on forever and ever and ever. Rather difficult to imagine, really, because we have finite minds. And when we talk about things going on forever and ever, we coin a term for it which is infinity. It means we can't see the ending of it. And therefore, this is a concept very real to us. But is it a real concept in terms of what God has revealed to man, what the Bible says, and what is promised to us? Well, let's explore the avenue this time of the nature of immortality. And to do this, in our program today, we have with us in the studio, Jim Dillingham. Jim, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Jim, what is mortality and what is immortality? Mortality is simply expressed as that which is dying. If something is, immor if something is mortal, then they're in a dying state. Hmm. Immortality is simply the lack of mortality. It is something that continues on forever, has life hmm. forever. Uh, a mortal being is one that is living but in a dying state. An immortal being is one that will never die and does not possess the capability of dying. Mm. Right, right. So we are very familiar with the state of mortality. <laughs> um, some people see mortality as being natural. You know, it's natural to die. It's natural for animals to die. It's natural for the child to grow old and die. But is it really natural? Must it be natural? Uh, where did mortality come from? Mortality entered in, not in the creative state. It could not have been what God originally created because it, it, we read that all things were good in God's eyes. Death is never expressed in Scripture as something that is good or clean in God's eyes, but something most definitely unclean. Not part of the created state, but something that was changed. It was introduced as the curse due to the failure of Adam and Eve. Mm. They failed before God. He gave them one law in the garden. They could not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They partook of it. Therefore, the sentence of death was placed upon them. Mm. This understanding, although not accepted by all, is most definitely expressed repeatedly in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul writes, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by mm. sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so Paul tells us that death was not there prior to sin. Death is a result of sin. And because of that death that was introduced into the world, all men die. So it was clear the that there was, there was no death a at all in this earth before Adam and Eve sinned. Absolutely. There right. was no room for it. It was not part of the created process mm. because everything was good in God's eyes. Mm. Because of the sin, because of the failure, one of God's principles had to be held true, mm. that the wages of sin is death. Therefore, death was introduced into the world, into God's creation, and it became a principle for anything that was living, from mankind to plant life to animals. Everything that was living would die. Nothing mm. lives forever. Mm. This principle of death and death being the result of sin is expressed time and time and time again in scripture mm. as a matter of fact dropping down a little further in Romans 5 verse 19 for it is by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one many shall be made righteous simply because we have we are under the law of sin and death we have a hope of being redeemed from that of being brought back from that state 
of mortality, mm. of something that we can hope for, look forward to. If we further uh, follow that thought through, Paul speaks more on this subject, comes down to chapter 8 of, chapter Ro of mm. Romans, and if we drop down in Romans 8 to verse 22, this is what Paul says in relation to overcoming this law of mortality. He says, we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, mm -hmm. to wit, the redemption of our body, for we are saved by hope. Mm -hmm. We are saved by the hope of the redemption of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Our bodies will be redeemed, redeemed from the curse, from the curse that came, the curse of death that came by sin. This is what we look forward to see. This is through Jesus Christ, as is alluded here, and as is spoken of very clearly in Romans 5 and 19. By the obedience of one, many shall be made righteous. Mm. We come under the law of sin and death through uh, inheritance. By being born. Just exactly. By being born. by being born, the inheritance from mm. Adam, that mm. we inherit this nature of mortality. Mm. We can inherit a different nature. Okay. A nature of immortality. Okay. Now, now, after Adam and Eve sinned, we find a period of time before the flood when men actually lived to great old ages, 950, 930 years, 969 years was Methuselah. And then we find people like you know, Abraham living over 100 and Jacob living over 100 years of age, but now we've dropped down. Now, was this sort of a dying away of that um, better state? There it's was still all mortality, though, isn't it? Absolutely. Right. They were still dying. Yeah. Mm. They did live for an extended period of time, but there were very different conditions under yeah. the, uh, the world prior to the flood. Mm. We read that there was a mist that watered the earth. Mm. Uh, with a canopy of moisture around the earth, we mm. would not experience the seasons that we do mm. now. Mm. We, and science uh, and archaeology around the world confirms that there was a very sudden mm. drop in temperature in certain areas of the earth. Uh, there was a change in the conditions that would bring about a lessening of the length of life of mankind on the earth. There was a change in the conditions, but even before the flood, after the flood, we were always under this, subject to this law of death. Mm. Even Adam that lived 930 years was in a dying state mm. and came to a cessation of his life. And he too looks forward to that time when he might be redeemed from mm. the power of death that is only through that one man that Paul speaks of in Romans 5, by that one man, we might have righteousness. We might have life. So in effect, there's really two progenitors. We've got Adam, who's the progenitor for everybody who dies. And because we've been born in that race, we obviously are in a dying state. Now, if we're going to break that cycle, we have to get into another father, another progenitor uh, to Absolutely. break that cycle. Absolutely. Yeah, Matter right. of fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, we read the fact that uh, of these two men, uh, Adam and Christ, mm. in Adam all die, in mm. Christ all are made alive. Let's right. pursue that thought yeah, a little yeah. bit. Thanks, in yeah. Philippians chapter 3, we read about this redemption from death, this change in the nature through mm. Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, starting in verse 20, we read that our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We look for this. Our citizenship, we read, is now in heaven, mm. where we look for our Savior to come. Mm. He will come and he will change our bodies. Remember how we read in Romans the fact that uh, we hope in this redemption of our bodies, that we might change these bodies. And this is what we read here. We look for our Savior to come from heaven where our citizenship is now, to come from heaven that he might change our bodies to be like his mm. because he is no longer under the law of sin and death. He now possesses immortality. He has been changed into a nature that we look forward to be changed into. Mm. Right, right. So in effect, what we must do is try and line ourselves up behind the new Adam, the one who is the author of eternal life, uh, the beginning of a new race, uh, the firstborn from the dead. Uh, th this is the mechanism of lining up. Now, it's the process of this redemption that, that we must take interest in, Jim. Absolutely. Mm. The process requires, as we've read already, Christ to return to the earth. Mm. When he returns to the earth, he says repeatedly that he will raise the dead mm. for judgment. Mm. That resurrection is key to our faith. 
If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is a right. chapter that deals very strongly with this concept of the resurrection, uh, of those being brought back from the dead. Paul deals with it because of those within the Corinthian ecclesia who were suggesting that there was no resurrection. There was no mm. need for a resurrection. Why do we even have to have a resurrection? False doctrine being introduced mm. into the church. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 13, Paul talks in this context. He says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ isn't risen. Mm. He says, if we take the resurrection of the dead out of our, our understanding of the gospel, then, there, then there's nothing. Because if Christ mm. hasn't risen, mm. then we die in our sins. There's no hope. If we mm. continue down to verse 18, Paul writes, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most mm. miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He also says that if there's no, no resurrection, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Mm. There is no hope outside the resurrection. Key mm. to our understanding of the gospel, key to our understanding of this change in nature, this reward that is offered to us that is now held for us in heaven. Again, Jim, this is a key to another problem too, and that's the concept of immortality being placed upon a soul, as it does with many Christian groups. Now, if you've got an immortal soul, when the person dies, that soul goes off to enjoy heaven, if it's good. But Paul's just said, there is no hope without resurrection. Exactly. Exactly. This concept of mm. presently possessing mm. immortality mm. runs totally against Scripture Contrary teaching. To scripture. Mm. The reward that's yeah. offered is a redemption from the curse in, in Eden, the curse mm. of death. As a matter of fact, immediately following the curse, uh, we read in Genesis chapter 3 that, that God had Adam and Eve ejected from the garden, and the reason being that they per do not partake of the tree of life and live forever. Mm. Why would God eject them from the garden so they wouldn't live forever if they already possessed the ability to in live forever? In an immortal soul. Exactly. Yes. Yes. This is, there's a change mm. in the nature. This is mm. required. If we continue down 1 Corinthians 15, we see this very clearly, that as we are now, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 51 of that same chapter where he mm. deals with this problem, he says, I'm sorry, in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. There has to be a change. As we are now with flesh and blood, we mm. cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Mm. And so making that statement, he pursues that thought. In verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, not a present possession, something that's added to us, mm. not something that's taken away. This body is taken away so that immortality might be revealed. That's mm. not the way it's expressed. What it's mm. expressed is immortality is clothed on mortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Then he goes on to say, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. The mm. curse of the garden mm. is no more. So the stage at which one gets immortality uh, in an immortalized body, that is, is at the moment at which mortality is consumed. Absolutely. In other words, when a person dies, unless they come back with the resurrection to be given immortality by God through the, the hand of Jesus Christ, they can never have immortality. Absolutely. And therefore the whole concept of the immortal soul is totally foreign to the Bible. Mm. It is no part mm. of the promises that are offered. It yes. is just the opposite of the promises yes. that are offered. This is something that has come from paganism from hundreds and thousands mm. of years ago, mm. uh, seen in many religions that have yes. absolutely nothing to do with Judaism, Christianity, mm. always this concept of the fact that we don't really die. Mm. It may be pleasing to listen to, it is pleasing to the flesh to think of, but it is not what's presented in Scripture. What's presented in Scripture is that death is the result of sin. We mm. need to be saved from death, mm. from that law of sin and death. We need to be redeemed, our bodies, as we're told, must mm. be redeemed from the law of sin and death. This is what Jesus speaks about, a change in our nature, being born again. In John chapter 3, uh, we read about how Nicodemus, one of the, uh, uh, the Jewish authorities mm. of his time, came to him in the middle of the night so that he might not be seen mm. coming to the master because it would be embarrassing for him and a man in his position. 
A lot comes of peer to, pressure. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, and Jesus tells him that if, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And he mm. can't understand this. How could I be born again? And then Jesus puts it in the terms of the fact that we have to be born of water and born of spirit, or we mm. can't see the kingdom of God. Mm. What he's talking about here is the two natures, mm. being born of water, being born of the mortal nature, mm. being born of spirit, being born of the spirit nature, the nature that we will be changed to, because as Paul expresses, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Mm. Flesh and spirit can, but not flesh and mm. blood. We have to have a change in our nature. Mortal must put on immortality. We must be clothed with immortality. Mm -hmm. And this is how we can inherit the kingdom of God. We mm -hmm. have to uh, literally take on the nature of God. The idea you were saying earlier on about the different views of philosophy, uh, uh, which bred this idea of the immortal soul, didn't most of this come from Plato? his philosophy which started it off and it sort of got mixed up with many religions from there? Very strongly. It's mm. also evident very strongly in the Egyptian uh, religious uh, process. Mm. It can be mm. seen in quite a number of them all the way dating all the way back to Babylon. Mm. Very strongly presented by Plato and through the, uh, the Greek influence of mm. his day spread throughout all nations. Mm. This concept uh, that he purported of we don't really die, mm. we have a consciousness that lives on that death is a change from one state to another. Change in constituent atoms, I think is the way he expresses something <laughs> like that. <laughs> change the format. <laughs> exactly. We look yeah. for a change, yes. but not a right. death. Right. We look for our change at resurrection. Mm. Look at the terms in which uh, Paul expresses the resurrection. Mm. In 1 Corinthians 15, back there again, starting at verse 42, this is the way Paul expresses the resurrection because they didn't understand it. So here's how he expresses it. He says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown mm. in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Mm. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Hence, born of spirit. Exactly. Yeah, a right. natural, there is a natural body. Mm. There is a spiritual body. But a body, mm. something mm. of substance, something that's mm. real and touchable and has substance, a mm. spiritual body. Christ had a spiritual body when he was raised and rewarded with immortality. He was able to pass through locked doors, mm. but he was able to be touched as well. Mm. And he said, touch the, my hand, see the holes, touch my side, mm. reach your hand into the hole, see me, touch me, I'm real, mm. I'm not a ghost. He it's said. interesting he said, that ghosts don't have flesh and bones. Exactly. Didn't he? So well, he, he didn't say blood. He didn't say blood, no, that's <laughs> exactly. right. Exactly. <laughs> he had poured out his blood. Yes. In his right. life, he had, yeah. this is one of the great laws uh, that God gave, mm. that the Jewish people were not to eat blood, they were to pour it out at the base of mm. the altar. Mm. He poured out his blood, his life, as the blood represents, mm. all his life. By mm. pouring it out, he showed that he wanted real life, spiritual mm. life, not flesh and blood life that cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but mm. real life spirit, flesh, life. Mm. And so we have to be born again, born of the spirit. This takes place after the resurrection, right. after right. judgment, when we are either re rewarded with this change in nature to a spiritual mm. nature, or we dissolve okay. into the dust. Now, at the resurrection, when the bodies are reconstituted again, uh, formally, like they were when they died, um, that personality is placed back in the body again, so that person becomes a living continuation of what died previously. And will that body be the same, therefore, as what the mortal people will be who will be alive and, uh, and ready for judgment at Christ's return? Yes. Resurrection does not offer immortality. Resurrection brings one to a position of judgment before Christ. Right. As Jesus expresses in uh, one of his parables in Matthew 25, mm. the parable of the sheep and the goats, he comes back, he, he raises the dead, sets the... Uh, those that are acceptable on his, on his right hand, those that are not acceptable on his left hand, he judges. Then he rewards. Then he says, enter the kingdom. Yeah. And then he says to the others, leave and be punished with everlasting punishment. Yeah. The reward takes place after the judgment, which according to Christ takes place after the resurrection, which takes place after his return. Yeah. Upon resurrection, one is brought to a position, uh, a nature that they had before. This nature of immortality must be clothed upon mortality, 
not a dead state, mm -hmm. but mortality. Mm -hmm. right. Paul says mortality must be clothed upon okay. with immortality. There's got to be something there to be changed. Exactly. Right. You can't there has change to be nothing. life to begin with. <laughs> there has to be something that's not with Christ. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the life that we'll enjoy mm -hmm. is the very nature of God, as is expressed so beautifully by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Beautifully put, when Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, born again, mm -hmm. begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible. The inheritance is incorruptible. It mm -hmm. will not die away. That's what we will inherit being born a second time. He pursues mm -hmm. this in his second letter, also mm -hmm. in the beginning, in Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. According to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life, the uncorruptible inheritance, and godliness through, how is this achieved? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. So therefore virtually... Uh, a definition of immortality is the divine nature. Exactly. But tell me, the, the Bible also says that God only hath immortality. Now, if that's the case, okay, how do we get it in the light of that comment? He has to give it to us. Okay. Uh, he, he is the giver of immortality. He right. is the ultimate right. possessor, okay. and he can give it to others. Now, the process mm -hmm. and how it takes place, Jesus expresses it very nicely in John mm -hmm. chapter 14. In John 14... And starting in verse 2, Jesus says to his disciples, If I go and prepare a place for you, I'm sorry, verse 2, if my, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Mm. Look what he says. He says, I'm leaving you. I'm going to prepare a place mm. with my Father, a place in heaven. And then I'm going to come again. And when I come again, I'm going to take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Mm. Now, the key to understanding this would be to understand the word mansion. The word mansion there in the Greek is the Greek word M-O-N-E. I'm not exactly mm. sure how to pronounce that. But if we drop down a little further in this chapter of John 14, we'll see where it's used again. In verse 23, he used the same Greek word, although it's translated slightly differently, but it expresses the very much the same terms. He says, Jesus answered and said to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. Mm. Exact same word, abode. Right, right. He goes to heaven to prepare these abiding places. And he says, I will come again. Mm. He brings them with him. That we might be as he is. Remember how it spoke about it in Philippians 3, that he comes from heaven where our citizenship is, these mm -hmm. abiding places, that he might make our bodies like unto his. This is what's being promised here, these abiding places. Mm -hmm. He says in Revelation 22 and 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me mm -hmm. to, give according, to give every man according as his work shall mm -hmm. be. And so he went to heaven to prepare this reward, these abiding places, this citizenship. He comes again. When he comes, he brings the reward with him, and that reward is the divine nature. That reward is immortality. The scripture also uses another term like, um, in heaven there is a, a book of life up there, and that our names must be written in that book of life. And so effectively, these are the ones who are earmarked, it might be, for immortality. So when Christ returns, he brings the book of life with him. So the life that's stored up for us in heaven is not to be enjoyed in heaven, it's to be received down here. So he's going to bring a book of life with him. Absolutely. Yeah, right. As a matter of fact, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, <coughs> Paul expresses it very nicely and ties everything together mm. that we've said. He says, it's re <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, mm -hmm. he uh, talks about the earthly and heavenly tabernacle or abiding place mm. or mansion. Mm. He says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he's talking about this tabernacle, this abiding mm. place, this body. If this body were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Mm. These abiding places that are prepared for us by Jesus Christ in the heavens that he'll bring with us when he comes. 
He says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. We groan, the, um, just as it said in Romans 8, all creation groans together, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Paul's terms in 1 Corinthians 15, that immortality must clothe mortality. He says, If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For, that, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we would be uh, unclothed, not that we die, but mm. clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Mm. This is what's being offered. Jesus has gone to heaven to mm. prepare the reward. These abiding places, write our names in the book of life. Mm. He will come again. When he comes, he brings the reward with him. This reward of a change in mm. nature. The resurrection takes place. We are judged, acceptable or unacceptable. Mm. Those that are acceptable shall be changed in nature. We'll be born again into a spirit being, but mm. it will be a spirit body. Our yeah. bodies will be redeemed from the law of sin and death. Interesting, too, to note how where it says uh, in 1 Corinthians there, 15, change from mortality to immortality, in the reference you just quoted, it says change from mortality to life. Interesting to see, isn't it? What we've got now is not considered as life. Not to God. It's a, it's a vapor, it's a dream, it's just a, a small existence. It's not really life, is it? So, Absolutely. in effect, where we started by saying that um, most people consider that a mortal dying man is natural to God, it's not. It's the other way around. Exactly. We are dying people where the natural life to God is a life that he's got. Goes on living forever. Mm. That's the difference between the it's thinking of the flesh and the thinking yeah. of the spirit. Very God looks at yeah. things very differently than mm. the way we look at mm. things. Okay. If we use our own wisdom, that wisdom, mm. according mm. to God, is foolishness to him. Right. He look at, looks at things very differently, defines okay. things very differently yeah. than we do naturally. Right. That's why we have to turn to the scripture for the answers, right. because our natural thinking will take yeah. us away from God. Sure, sure. Jim, in the time remaining for us, how do we make that jump <laughs> from what's not life today to life, real life? in the kingdom of age. What's the nature of, of salvation? And How are we saved? What can we change? We should do. The first yeah. things we should do is understand the truth because mm. we're told many times in Scripture that we are saved by truth. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians mm. 15, it's expressed, that's how the chapter begins. Mm. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which mm. I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein you stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached to you unless you believed mm. in vain. Mm. And then begins to deal with this subject mm. of the resurrection. We have to yeah. find the true gospel by which we can be saved. Yes. That's the first step. Right. And then follow what the gospel tells us, what God tells us to do, because if we don't know God, mm. then we can't inherit his nature. Mm. We can't be filled with his knowledge now. Then we will not be filled with mm. God when Christ returns. And we have the words of Christ to his own disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. He that believes this gospel and is baptized, becomes a candidate for salvation and can be saved. Absolutely. Very important choice in a very important direction. Jim, thanks for coming in today, and thanks very much for a very interesting presentation My in pleasure. our program today. And thank you also, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on another of the programs that we have. If you'd like more information on immortality, mortality, and the jump into real life in Christ Jesus, then please ask for some literature from the Christadelphians. Just contact the number that you'll see at the end of this program, and we'd be, we would be delighted to send it to you without any cost whatsoever. Thank you for joining us, and 